introduce Dr. Ben Habib from La Trobe University. Uh, ben is sort of, has an interesting, I think, profile in terms of scholarship, obviously in international relations, uh, mainly kind of interested in Korea, uh, but in various aspects, uh, security, um, I saw that you published on Trump and, and nuclear uh, war and security and so on, but also, of course, on uh, environmental issues and climate change. And uh, Ben is also um, advising series on permaculture, which I think is, is an interesting sort of side uh, to all the uh, scholarly work you're doing. So, adapting to environmental shocks in North Korea, networks, geography, and resilience. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, apologies for my husky voice and, and periodic coughing today. I've got the, the academic flu that we often get at this time of year uh, from burning the candle at both ends. So, uh, apologies uh, for any uh, cough based interruptions. Uh, big note of thanks. Uh, to the Department of LLC for the in invitation to come and present in this seminar series uh, and to Andy uh, for making that happen. So thank you for having me. Uh, my thinking on this topic has evolved a bit since I sent this title and abstract to Andy back in May. Uh, it's going to be more about networks and geography and perhaps less about environmental shocks per se. Uh, I'm going to present a case uh, drawing on complex systems thinking with a dash of political geography and, and political ecology. Uh, that geography is the key to understanding patterns of governance, economy uh, and cultural perspectives uh, and human security in North Korea. I think geography is, is I see geography as interdependent with and complementary to institutional, economic and cultural perspectives on North Korea. There's a, a massive body of scholarship uh, on the DPRK. Uh, and it's a space that's very difficult to find a niche. And that's something I want to speak to a little, a little bit further in a minute. I see geography and environment often are missed as dynamic variables in analysis of what's going on in North Korea. I don't want to position them as the explanation of everything, uh, but I think this environment and geography is a missing piece uh, that can add value and add some nuance and texture to other perspectives uh, on North Korean affairs. So in terms of what I'm going to talk about today, first I'm going to reflect on the genesis of this particular project and my position in bringing this project forward uh, and what I'm trying to contribute uh, more broadly to the field of North Korean studies. Uh, I'll introduce my field method and my analytical framework. I'll flesh out the interplay of landscape elements, so geography and infrastructure networks, uh, on patterns of governance, economy and human security in the DPRK. And I'll muse on some observations and, imp and implications for further exploration uh, of North Korea from this perspective. Uh, this is an ongoing project. My thoughts are evolving, so any uh, feedback that you might have uh, will be greatly appreciated. So please do in the, in the Q&A or have a chat with me afterwards or correspond with me uh, via the, the social media outlets that you see there. Now, in terms of positioning myself and, and where this project has come from, uh, what's my contribution? This is been a, a guiding question for my broader academic practice, not just this project. Uh, over the past few years, I've become very reflective about my role as an academic and what social value uh, comes, I can uh, provide that comes with this position. Uh, you know, some of you may have known about my uh, infamous panic attack on live television uh, a couple of years ago on ABC News Breakfast. Uh, which turned out to be something really great because I wrote about it and that's, that's a, a side point, but that really was an event horizon for me to really reflect on what is it I'm doing as an academic, why am I doing this, and what kind of value can I add uh, to this field. Uh, I also stepped away for a while from doing studies on North Korea because I'd cut my teeth 
uh, as a you know, really hard security expert. I did my PhD on North Korea's nuclear weapons program. And I found myself saying pretty much the same thing repetitively because the security environment, you know, give or take, uh, you know, the, the pomp and vagaries and occasional stupidity of various leaders. <laughs> I'll just leave that there. Uh, the actual dynamics of this strategic theatre haven't changed for decades uh, and they're not likely to in the near future. Uh, so, I, like from an intellectual perspective, I found that quite dull. Uh, and from thinking about, okay, what can I, what value can I add as a professional here, that wasn't the space where I, I felt that I could do something worthwhile. Uh, so I started to uh, work on environmental perspectives. I've done some work on uh, North Korean climate vulnerability and adaptation, as well as how the DPRK government has engaged with the International Framework Convention on Climate Change. Uh, and so where I'm going with this project is building on that body of work rather than on the hard security stuff. Uh, also in terms of me as a, a researcher, I'm aware that I'm you know, a white guy from Adelaide looking at this <laughs> foreign country far away. What is it from my background as someone whose Korean language skills are shamefully not as good as they should be? Uh, What's the niche that I can add some value to this field, given where I'm coming from and, and my linguistic limitations? Uh, so I think analysing landscape and physical features, that's the language that I'm really skilled at reading and interpreting, and that's the language that I want to share and inject into my study space. So in the last 12 months, I've come back to DPRK studies. I've been uh, working in collaboration uh, with our colleague Jay Song from Melbourne University, who many of you know. Uh, and we've been doing some work on patterns of outbound migration from North Korea. Uh, it's part of Jay's larger ARC project. I came in to, uh, to collaborate on the environmental dimension to that. And in that work, I came across a couple of really interesting data sets that I was fascinated by the interplay between them. And that initially I wasn't sure what I could infer from these data sets. The two of them are depicted up here. The first one on the left uh, is the province of origin of North Korean defector arrivals in South Korea. So this comes from the Ministry of Unification in Seoul. Uh, and this shows overwhelmingly that defectors are coming from North and South Hamgyong provinces and Yanggang province. So these are all along the river border frontier with China. Uh, you know, initially I thought, yeah, that makes sense. These provinces are less developed. Uh, they're a bit more isolated uh, than other parts of the country. Uh, and they've got proximity to the border. So it makes sense that uh, people would be fleeing from these places. The second data set on the right uh, something I compiled from reports in Korean Central News Agency and, and Rodong Shinmun, which are official news sources from North Korea, uh, which document typhoon impacts in North Korea by province. So if in any given year there was a documented typhoon damage uh, assessment that was in official media, it gets a red box. Uh, what I see in this data set is there's a higher incidence of documented typhoon impacts in the southern provinces, not in the northern provinces where most of the documented outbound migration was occurring. Now, my initial thought was that environmental shocks would combine with existing human insecurities uh, in the northern provinces to trigger people to leave. But the typhoon <coughs> impact data on the right here suggests that that relationship was more complex. Uh, and so that was really interesting. So clearly there's a complex matrix of factors that shape human insecurities, and we know that from the human security literature. But there was also something about geography and the environment and the topography of North Korea that was shaping this picture. Uh, there was something about that that was, was missing in the way I was approaching this. Uh, and there were patterns and possibilities and constraints there were barriers and paths of least resistance shaping the defection outcomes 
that we see in the left-hand graph that were related to the physical uh, topography of place across the country. Uh, so this is something that I really wanted to, to flesh out and explore further. Now the conundrum of these data sets led me to reflect back on my past field work in North Korea. So I've been to North Korea three times, uh, in 2008, 2012 and 2013. So it has been a few years since my last visit. Uh, but I've also been to Yanbian Korean Autonomous Prefecture, which is in Jilin province, right adjacent to, to North Korea. And I've been to South Korea pretty much annually uh, since 2008. So I spent a lot of time in this region, if not necessarily in North Korea. Uh, there are limitations when you go into North Korea and you're trying to do field work. This is not a place where you can be a freewheeling traveller. It's not a place where you can go and you know, do loads of interviews uh, with people. It's a very manicured experience. You're on a chaperoned tour. Uh, you've got limited opportunities for dialogue with locals. Uh, there's a set itinerary, so it is a tour. Uh, and you're under constant surveillance, so you know that your tour guides, as pleasant as they are, are also inter intelligence operatives who go and report on you to their superiors every night. So it's not just spying, but they're data mining from you to see you know, what the foreigners are thinking about what they're seeing. Uh, in country. So with that in mind, you, and you're well briefed on this before you go in, so it's not a secret. Uh, so this led me to think about, okay, how am I going to get something useful out of this experience? Uh, so I developed a field, me field method which I call reading the landscape. And this is based on political geography and political ecology. Uh, and over time I've also added a, a complex systems perspective into this which I acquired from my extracurricular interests in permaculture, and, and that's based on uh, ecological systems. So in terms of the political geography approach, uh, you know, this is about how barriers between people and communities are put up and come down, or, or how political entities are geographically and spatially ordered how material processes and political movements interact with space and place. Uh, so it's very attractive for someone who's, you know, by personality, I'm very much into reading patterns and pattern recognition. I'm not a small details person. Uh, I'm very much a big picture pattern thinker. So this, this form of reading landscapes and, and taking in my environment as I'm going through it very much fits in with how I interact with the world more broadly. Uh, and I was particularly influenced by a couple of articles by a UK geographer called Peter Atkins. And he did some work on North Korea. And he, his argument was that the politics, economy and culture of that country are coded into North Korea's landscapes, uh, into the built environments and into the ways that uh, natural systems have been mediated by human activity uh, and intervention in a very anthropocentric way. Uh, sharing a lot of commonalities with how uh, the human relationship with nature was framed across other countries in the communist bloc through the Cold War as well. Uh, but that was a really, really uh, liberating perspective for me because it meant, okay, I've now got a pattern language to be able to go in and, and interpret what I'm seeing and that's my data set, uh, my observations of place rather than talking to people and, and doing the usual sci social scientific approach. Now, to give that some meat, uh, I drew on uh, some insights from the complex systems uh, literatures. Now, complex systems thinking is a broad spectrum uh, of different perspectives that come from the natural sciences. Uh, but these perspectives share a few uh, common points. So the main things that I was looking for, you know, drawing on a complex systems view, uh, were the following, and I'll, I'll tease these out. So firstly, I'm looking for networks. I think we intuitively know uh, what networks are, uh, but it, embedded in it is the view that no entity is an isolated, atomized thing, right? Everyone, everything, every organism is intimately interrelated and interconnected with everything that's around it. Uh, so everything exists within some kind of network. And you've got nodes who are the individual actors within those networks, 
hubs where clusters of nodes come together, uh, and flows, which is about the connections between the nodes and hubs uh, and the things and the, the uh, nature of the relationships between the nodes in the network. These flows could be of resources, goods, people, energy, water, information, and the direction and size of these flows tell us about the relationships within the networks uh, and with people and place, etc. Also important from a systems view is uh, the concept of edges or the boundaries between different systems. Uh, are you looking at hard boundaries? Uh, or are you looking at edges of systems where there's lots of interface? Uh, and that's a really interesting view, thinking of North Korea, and particularly thinking about the kinds of borders that North Korea has with surrounding places, uh, where there are hard boundaries and where there are particular spots of more dynamic interface. Uh, and those places of interface, I think, are the most interesting places in the DPRK. Uh, definitely not the DMZ. I think the DMZ is one of the least interesting uh, edges uh, in North Korea. Don't tell the security people that I've said that. Another concept which is really important from a complex systems view is this idea of something called Holons, uh, like colon but with a H. And the idea is here is that individual entities at any scale are simultaneously both a constituent part of larger systems and also a whole system in and of themselves. Uh, so if you think of the human body, we're not just a single entity. There's all kinds of communities of different cells and organisms uh, that help to regulate the functionality of our bodies as a biological entity. Uh, and then you think of individual humans, obviously we're constituent parts of all di kinds of different uh, ecological, economic and political systems and so forth at a larger scale. So this Holland's view helps understand how people relate to place, how place relates to the state, how the state relates to international systems, etc. I think this is a really powerful uh, conceptual framing for thinking about uh, governance uh, and the interplay between different levels of governance at different scales. And this, this is a really exciting direction that international relations scholarship is starting to go. Uh, but in the field, Interpreting landscapes means looking at whatever <coughs> vista or place that you're looking at as an assemblage of networks, flows, edges and holons. So these are the things I'm looking for in the field and reflecting back and looking through my photographic evidence, for example, these are the kinds of things uh, that I'm looking at. And this, is, this photo is an example. So this is of a, a small farming village uh, just outside of Kaesong uh, in the south. And there's a lot of stories going on in this picture. Uh, you know, even just looking at this picture, I'm going to tease out what these stories are. And first, let's tell the story of the soil. And what we're seeing here is a place that has poor soil fertility. Uh, and because of that poor soil fertility, it means they have to source fertilizers from further afield. Uh, now, North Korea's industrial capacity for fertilizers is very compromised, which means they have to source them from elsewhere afield. <coughs> Their trade relationships with the international community are very restricted. Uh, so that forces them into dependencies on donor relationships to get these kinds of critical inputs. So you can see how the fertility of the soil links this place into all kinds of uh, international economic networks and flows. Uh, as well as to the actual nutrient cycles of the ecosystem in which <coughs> this place is located. Then we get to the story of the crops. Now, if we look, these are all monocrops, you know, which is not unusual. The Green Revolution agricultural model is of tilling fields of one single crop rather than diverse uh, ecosystems full of lots of different crops. All of the available land is tilled, so right up to these apartments that land is being used. So that tells you a story. Uh, that tells you that, well, North Korea doesn't have a great deal of arable land, so every bit of space counts for growing food. Uh, we know that most of the produce grown here is appropriated by the state for distribution uh, through official channels or through redirection uh, for priority use by the military. <coughs> 
we look at the story of the road that goes through here. Uh, this is one of our flow points. This is the primary network linkage for moving goods and people. But we see this road is unpaved, like most roads in North Korea. Uh, so what do you think happens when there's a big monsoon rain? Yeah, I mean, these roads are shitty and potholes at the best of times. It's not easy to move things at distance. So when you get storm events, these roads can become unpassable, compromises the flows. If we look at the story of the houses, well, unlike a lot of houses in regional areas in North Korea, these ones are electrified, and we can see that from the power lines. Uh, they're multi-storey and relatively new, uh, as opposed to other places in, in regional North Korea. Uh, so that tells us, you know, for a rural location, these are relatively privileged uh, housing spots. And we know Kaesong, because of its proximity to the DMZ, to be able to live down there uh, means you have to have demonstrated some kind of uh, reliable political status within the, uh, within the Songbun class system that exists uh, in the country to be allowed to live there. If you go to other parts uh, of the country, outside the big cities, uh, the housing is noticeably more rudimentary. There's a few people in this picture too. You can just see them here. Uh, and what you do see going through the countryside is that there's heaps of people there walking on the roads and tilling the fields doing work. And compare that to the countryside in Australia where you could drive hundreds of kilometres and not see anyone uh, in agricultural land. Uh, and that tells you something about the demechanisation of the agricultural sector that happened in the 1990s. Uh, and that a lot of farm labour now is manual labour because there's fuel shortages there's just not enough energy to be able to power industrialised agriculture like we have in the West. Even though that's the model that they used to have in the Cold War, it was a very mechanised agricultural system, but not now. And when you're driving through the countryside and you look at the people that you see, they are visibly more ragged uh, and less bulky, more skinny than the people that you see in Pyongyang. Now, of course, it's a limited data set. You're only observing the people that you see. Uh, but there does appear to be a big difference uh, in what the people look like, and which says something about the greater difficulty uh, of their living conditions. Uh, and we know that where people <coughs> live is governed by the state. So to live in a big city and get that privilege means you're of a, uh, in a trusted class. You've proven your political reliability. Uh, you don't have any connections to less reliable or what's called the hostile classes in the Songbun system. Uh, so that where you live is a carrot and stick. Uh, you do the right thing, you get to live in a more privileged location. Uh, you do the wrong thing, or you've got connections to people that do, and you live in more difficult circumstances. So there's a lot going on in this picture. It, it tells the story of intersecting sets of relationships an interlocking dance of geography and environment with human networks. Uh, it's also a completely human-mediated landscape. Uh, demonstrates the anthropocentric ontology of North Korean ideology and social organisation. Uh, and it's a microcosm of some of the systems of political and economic control that exist in the country. So, operationalising this in the field, you're identifying specific landscape elements uh, as the starting point of this complex systems analysis. So, in terms of the geography, you're, you're looking for clues about the topography, which is obvious because you've got mountains, rivers, etc. Uh, watersheds, soils and underlying rock strata, the prevailing climate and weather patterns, uh, flora and fauna and things like that. Uh, when you're considering the human influence on landscapes, you're looking for clues from buildings and technology and infrastructure, boundaries, fences, walls and patterns of land use. Uh, all of these things are landscape elements that, as I've shown in the previous picture, tell a story uh, about the broader political and economic situation in the country. So the main argument I want to advance here uh, is when you look at all the landscape elements, this suggests that there's an axis of geography 
uh, you know, to reinterpret the famous George W. Bushism uh, about axis of evil. This axis of geography cuts uh, from northwest to southeast uh, across the middle of the uh, North Korea's part of the peninsula. Uh, and you see significantly different human footprints on either side of this axis, shaped by the topography of the country. Uh, and I think this is a, a more important variable in, in North Korean politics than is generally appreciated. And let's flesh this out a little bit. So let's start with topography uh, and some of the important land features here. Uh, through the north-south section here, you've got a mountain range called the Nungnim Sanmek. Uh, you've, up here, this very high tableland here has got the Kima Kowon, uh, and then you've got the Tebek Mountains uh, that go all the way into South Korea but terminate around here. Uh, so these are the main geological features of North Korea that shape so much about this country. Uh, one thing about mountains is that these are evidence of extreme geological activity. And that means there's lots of natural resources in there. So there's lots of mining goodies uh, that North Korea has. The fact that there's lots of uranium deposits in these hills is one of the reasons why North Korea uh, can run a, a fully internalised nuclear fuel cycle and why they've been able to uh, develop a nuclear weapons program. Uh, because they've got the raw materials. They haven't had to get it from anywhere else. But topography also shapes land use and agriculture. So if you look at this graphic here, uh, the availability of arable land is a really big story uh, in North Korea, uh, as is the fertility of the soils. Now, as a permaculture geek, I get pretty excited about uh, soil fertility uh, and that kind of thing. But one of the, the outcomes of the specific rock types that exist in these mountains is you get a soil that's weathered from the granites and schists uh, of these rocks it tends to be brownish and sandy and it lacks organic content and when you see it so if we go back to this photo you see you can see the soil is very brown and when you look at it and hold it it's clear that it doesn't have much organic content in there like if you went out here and grabbed some soil from the ground it's very dark brown and rich and you can see there's lots of different stuff in there that's not the case here so it's very obviously soil of low fertility uh, and you can see why there's a need for inputs to boost the fertility if you're going to keep uh, cropping it. Uh, the topography also impacts the population distribution and density, uh, as we see in this graphic here. Uh, settlements tend to develop where the soil is fertile and where there's water. So that, that's no shock. That applies everywhere. Uh, and consequently, we see you know, on this side of the axis of geography, uh, more dense sediment patterns on the western plains and on this side a bit in the Hamhung plain as well, but very low density through here. Uh, the topography also shapes possibilities for where you can build infrastructure networks because uh, it's a physical barrier, it's an engineering challenge to be able to build roads and railroads and stuff through that kind of terrain. Uh, and that affects the flows of resources and goods of people between human settlements. So it's these patterns of infrastructure networks that I think are particularly interesting. And to start off with, let's look at the, the road network. So the, obviously down here, the density of road network connections uh, is much higher. And this graphic uh, shows it even better, uh, I think. The primary road corridors in North Korea uh, are through here. There's an east-west road from Pyongyang to Wonsan, which I've been down and there's a north-south road going down here. These are the primary paved intercity roads, and they're concreted heavily enough that they can support the movement of tanks and heavy artillery. So these are strategic roads. Uh, and they're very wide. You can land aircraft on them as well. So these have this, this strategic purpose. Uh, but they're the exception rather than the rule. Most of these roads, as I said before, are unpaved. They're dirt roads. And that presents logistical problems for these as arteries of of goods and people flows. Uh, it's also interesting that, like if we go up here to the northeast, uh, the road connections, they're probably networked more closely with China than they are with Pyongyang uh, because of this topography. And we see that in the, in the dynamism of economic development up here in the Rasson area uh, with links to Yanji in, in Yanbian 
and also to Russia here. It's quite a dynamic uh, economic zone uh, at the moment. So you can see there's low network connectivity in this part of North Korea uh, with vulnerabilities because of the nature of those road networks being unpaved. It seems simple, but the simplicity of these observations have big implications for how things are done. What about the rail network? Well, again, we can see greater connectivity down on the west coast, on the plain here. Uh, large parts of the country are not serviced by rail at all, particularly in the northeast. So you've only got this one major line uh, following the coast here. Uh, but you're going into here, uh, there's nothing at all. The rail links to China and Russia, I think, are of growing interest. So we know uh, the Russian governments had plans to connect uh, North Korea to the Trans-Siberian Railway and then down into South Korea. So you could take a train, theoretically, from Busan uh, all the way to London if this thing ever gets off the ground. And we saw talk of this, this plan starting to re-emerge again last year when the, uh, the US-North Korea... Uh, summitry was underway and this, this kind of thinking was also integrated into South Korea's plans uh, for engagement. Uh, but again, one line here. What happens if there's a typhoon and there's flooding? Line gets cut off. If you're trying to move uh, material logistical support in the event of a natural disaster, your roads and the rail are cut off. That's a big vulnerability in terms of you know, government disaster response. And I think it's interesting to compare this to the level of road and rail connectivity in South Korea. Uh, you know, we go back to this one. This is just roads. But the rail network in, in South Korea is much more extensive and networked uh, as well. So hold that thought because I'm going to come back to that. If we look at the electricity grid, this illustrates the same pattern. You've got coastal and river border transmission links into the northeast. Uh, if you look closely on this, you know, we've all seen the, the nighttime satellite composite images uh, of North Korea, but you can trace where the electricity grids are. You know, you've got your dense connectivity here, and then if you can see it, you can see where the, the lines go into the northeast uh, by where the nighttime uh, illumination is. Uh, See, so just look at this map, but interpreting this map, a lot of this transmission infrastructure, like the power lines and so forth, they're ageing uh, and they're desperately in need of being uh, renovated. And there's also limited generating capacity. So the electricity grid, this infrastructure network is a major problem here. Uh, and again, vulnerable to storm damage disruption. So this relationship between topography and networks you know, seems pretty straightforward, but what does it mean? And that's you know, where I'm really interested in taking this. Uh, I'll start with the implications for disaster resilience. And this is connected with local level adaptive capacity. Uh, if we see, you know, we're looking, I'm influenced particularly by the work on resilience and adaptive capacity that's been done around the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, that informs multiple international environmental treaties. Uh, and this is the IPCC's most recent definition of adaptation. And if we look at this graphic here, these are the different elements that feed into the adaptive capacity of any given location. You know, if a, a community is hit by a storm, their ability to take the hit and to rebound afterwards is shaped by the degree to which these different elements are you know, are developed within that community. And from looking at the axis of geography and North Korea's patterns of networks, we can see that this shapes regional differences in adaptive capacity. So adaptive capacities on the southwest side of the axis of geography where network connections are dense is higher than in these northeastern provinces on the other side of the axis. Like I've said, infrastructure is vulnerable to disruption by disaster events. Now, this is what that looks like. This is, these are not my pictures, uh, specifically here. But these are pictures of 
damage caused by Typhoon Line Rock in 2016, which hit, had its greatest damages in North Hamgyong province, around the border region. So this is an area that doesn't usually get flood damage because it's right up in the mountains. So this was quite unprecedented. Uh, but look, look at the damage that it's done to the roads here. <coughs> then think about how North Koreans might actually construct roads and do reopen these things. It's a lot of manual labour. They don't have heaps of machinery to, uh, to go and fix these things. So that's a big project to reopen these links. It's something that can't be done overnight. And that's the... So thinking about the impact of having these connections cut over an extended period of time, that has a big impact on human security. <coughs> it also means this low connectivity in the northeast means that in the event of crisis, the government could also choose to cut off certain regions from government help. Now, there is some suggestion in the 1990s with the Great Famine that the government, in its time of crisis, did choose to triage areas of the northeast uh, and not provide uh, government support for people at that time uh, in those areas. That's made possible by the low network connectivity. Uh, it makes it very easy for the government to cut off supply because it's not the, the links are just not there. Now here's why the geography network nexus relates to a, the adaptive capacity of communities in the northeast and to the adaptation decisions of individual people. And this is where we combine networks, flows and edges from the complex systems playbook. Uh, and this brings me back to my original conundrum with the, those two graphs earlier. So follow my thinking here for a moment. Human insecurity is distributed across the DPRK, uh, although adaptive capacity is a bit worse in the northeast. Now, escape to China is an adaptation choice that's available to people in the northeast because of the immediate proximity to the border. It's right there. Now, this is not an option that's generally open to people further south. You know, it's enormously difficult to get from somewhere near Kaesong, for example. The DMZ border's shut. You can't cross that. It's a militarised frontier. It's not a pathway that's open to people trying to flee. So the path of least resistance is north to China. But if you're coming from down there, that's a difficult journey. <coughs> Uh, there's help on the Chinese side that's concentrated in Yanji and Yanbian uh, in Jilin province. So that's the most feasible crossing point into Yanbian is coming from North Hamgyong province uh, across the Tumen River. Now the forbidding uh, terrain and the limited transportation links make it difficult even in the best of circumstances for people further south in, to get to North Hamgyong province. Now combine that with the repressive and coercive apparatuses of the North Korean government, where there's travel restrictions, uh, you know, they're actively preventing people from moving. So it's extremely difficult uh, to get from the south uh, to China. Uh, and the geography of that area makes it much more easier for the government to be able to enforce those travel restrictions. Uh, because there's only limited routes to get there, uh, it's easy to block them off. Uh, there's bottlenecks. I love this photo. I don't even know how I managed to get out of Gaesong uh, without them deleting this. But the <laughs> it, it's eerie in, its, uh, in, in the broader meaning of what it's saying, I think. What I've realised in discussing this relationship with other audiences that I've shared this work with is that we could interpret other elements of state repression through the lens of geography and infrastructure network connectivity. Uh, and I think the geography does, in a sense, simplify the task of total control. Uh, Andre Lankov has said before that, uh, at least in the Kim Il-sung era, that North Korea was the closest model of a true totalitarianism that the world was ever seen. Now, that's not true anymore. Those, those systems of control have eroded significantly since the 1990s. But the topography 
places limitations on the movement of people and these network linkages that make it simpler for the government to police them and control them. Total control benefits from bottlenecks and that bottlenecks are what we see uh, in the infrastructure connections here. The lack of infrastructure network connectivity makes it more difficult for people to organise collectively at regional and national scales. Now this is where I want to bring in the comparison with South Korea. Uh, you know, and the various movements and protests that we've seen in South Korea over, over three decades now. And think about how is it that you can get two million people on the streets of downtown Seoul into Gwanghwamun? What physically has to be there to facilitate that flow of people to that place? And I think the, the density of transportation connections in South Korea really helps make that possible uh, in a way that those network connections don't exist in North Korea. Now, I'm not saying that lack of the, the low infrastructure connectivity is the reason we're not seeing organised resistance in North Korea. That story is much more complex than that. But I think that infrastructure networks are a facilitating factor that can shape what's possible in terms of how people mobilise uh, in any given space. So that North Korea-South Korea, -South Korea pa comparison is really fascinating. The last thing I wanted to touch on uh, was the impact of these network connectivity on economic development. It's a great irony that the places of greatest economic dynamism are in the northeast around the Rasan Special Economic Zone, uh, which are more closely integrated with Chinese networks and Chinese economic systems than with the rest of North Korea. And I think you, you can make a case that this is tied into the growth of the the Jungmadang, or these informal markets, uh, and with the yuanization of the economy. So now the, the North Korean won is essentially worthless now. Uh, so if you want to do any kind of commerce of note, you need Chinese currency. Uh, and that happens when you have connectivity uh, with the Chinese economy, when you're roped into the Chinese economic orbit. And that North Korea has become uh, as a result of these connections. Now, originally, North Korea's special economic zones, and particularly the run in, one in Rasan, it's been suggested that they were set up in the north, far away from Pyongyang, precisely because of this isolation, so that the pollution of capitalism and, and ideological impurity could be contained up there and wouldn't infect the rest of the country. Uh, and it's interesting to see how that logic has flipped around and made Rasan this place of dynamism uh, economic dynamism now. If we look at the, the potential for foreign direct investment in North Korea, uh, <coughs> well, there are interests starting to queue up, uh, seeing North Korea as this great prize, particularly for infrastructure development. Uh, there are limitations at present because of the poor transportation and energy systems. Uh, you know, if you were sitting, setting up a factory in North Korea, could you guarantee that you could get your products to international markets if there was some kind of supply disruption to roads or rail links, uh, or if port facilities are damaged, etc.? Can you ensure, like these textile factories here in Rasan, that you've got reliable electricity supplies to keep these factories running? You know? Energy insecurity was a factor in the demechanization and deindustrialization of the North Korean economy uh, during the, the 1990s. <coughs> and that continues to be a problem today. So, you know, those for North Korea's economic development, the, the integrity and quality of these networks are something that would be, have to be improved. You know, even if North Korea wanted to completely indigenize its development pathways, Network connectivity is still an issue for them. So I hope I've made a, a solid, if interesting, case for geography and networks as an underappreciated variable in North Korean studies. Uh, and what I'm aiming for is a research project that adds something meaningful to the field and takes advantage of my specific skill set, what I bring 
uh, to the table of someone who speaks and reads an ecological pattern language. Uh, so please, really looking forward to any comments and feedback you've got. Uh, and thank you very much uh, for your attention today. It's much appreciated. Thank you.